Kapitalismen sjuk. Och vilken är i så fall medicin? Miljoner människor känner sig lurade av giriga bankirer och med all orsak. Och bryr sig bankirerna på Wall Street nu om att vårt samhälle faller sönder och samman? Söker man lösningar som skulle kunna hjälpa oss alla? Let's not think about a solution. Let's just think about a way to make money from it. And that's why I said on the TV, I said, look, I'm not looking for a solution. I don't really want a solution. Actually, you know what? That's true. I, I, I've been, um, I said on the TV that I've been, dreaming, uh, I've been dreaming of a recession. And I still am. You know, I've been dreaming of a market that's going to plunge and go down. And people think, oh, that's terrible. No, it's not. Because it's a huge, it's a huge opportunity to make money from it. Men visst får vi också skylla oss själva. Vi vill så gärna tro att det finns en gratis lunch och evig tillväxt. Först egentligen borde vi ha kunnat förutse finanskrisen. Att marknaden kraschar hör liksom till marknadskapitalismen. Huonoja politiska valintoja. Det är liian kauan annettiin mennä, koska kaikki hyötyivät siitä. Ja poliittiset päättäjät tietenkin hyötyvät siitä, että kansantaloudessa menee lujaa. Kotitaloudet on tyytyväisiä, äänestäjät on tyytyväisiä, pankkirit teki virheitä. Ja tätä nykyistä systeemiä voisi kuvata vähän tällaiseksi niin kuin isojen korporaatioiden vallaksi, jossa ne käyttää valtioita hyväkseen saadakseen niitä asioita eteenpäin, mitä ne haluaa, niin kuin loppaamalla ja, ja niin kuin hyödyntämällä sitä valtion valtaa. Borde vi göra något mot vårt ekonomiska system? Finns det alternativ? Wall Street is on the net. Investment bankers are creatures of a capitalist environment. They're they're like sharks in the sea, and you can't blame them if they eat the baby seal. That's what they do. Kunde bostadsbubblan i USA växa sig så stor? Varför tog folk lån som de aldrig någonsin skulle kunna betala tillbaka? En orsak är att de blev lurade av skrupellösa mäklare. Men den egentliga orsaken är nog att allt såg så bra ut inom ekonomin. Det fanns pengar. Jag började sälja hans i San Diego 1984. Back when I was young and good looking. 06 and 07 where it just got crazier and crazier by the middle of 2007 you could literally get one and a half million dollars with no money down and no qualifying ju fler lån som beviljades ju fler hus som såldes desto mer klirrade det i kassa på Wall Street och sen började de stora investeringsbankerna slå ihop alla dessa bostadslån till en ny produkt som kunde säljas vidare till placerare i hela världen. Wall Street investment bankers and Wall Street traders complied and they said, "Okay, we're going to create this new class of investments based on housing and we're going to start trading them and selling them and you as an individual investor or you as a pension fund can invest." And that worked for a long time. Uh, it's a little banged up, as you can tell. And really, if you look at a lot of it, it's in pretty good shape for being that old. These floors are in good shape, that fireplace is all right. 
Wall Street hittade alltså på nya slag av värdepapper som var helt värdelösa. Och vanligt folk fattade inte att deras bostadslån egentligen var högriskplaceringar. They were blinded by greed. All their friends and family were doing it. They felt stupid if they didn't do it. They were ridiculed if they didn't do it. And then to make it worse, the people who knew the least about it were being advised by both realtors and loan brokers who literally set them up in bad deals. And maybe they didn't even know that they were bad deals. But the refrain that I heard over and over is, don't worry about it, we'll refinance you. As if a constant refinancing is going to somehow make it better later. I september 2008 kom kraschen. Men egentligen hade allt kraschat redan ett år tidigare. I think the only way to understand the summer of 2008 is to understand the summer of 2007. Banks had taken on tremendous risk associated with subprime mortgages. They had bet on subprime mortgages and they hadn't told anyone about these massive bets. They had done it in a way using derivatives, using swaps, was secret, was hidden from investors. And in the summer of 2007, the markets started to realize that the banks and AIG had these big bets. Little disclosures started to seep out into the markets. And as people started to realize that, the stock prices of the banks, the stock prices of AIG started to decline. There was tremendous pressure on them. And basically what happened from that point on over the next year was people figuring out what these financial institutions actually had did, had done. Um, from my perspective, most of the major financial institutions were probably insolvent in the summer of 2007. That's a full year before what we call the crisis. Hi. First, I want to apologize for how I'm dressed. <laughs> I don't normally wear a suit and tie. Um, Professor Frank Partnoy is nu för tiden expert på affärsjuridik, men han jobbade förut på Wall Street. And the big question is whether the corporation exclusively should think about shareholders and its responsibility to shareholders or whether the corporation, the people involved in the corporation, should think about society as a whole. Right? And that's really There's true. tremendous pressure on Wall Street to sell instruments that clients don't understand, to take on risks that aren't disclosed. And I'd like to think that I held my head high and that ultimately I left the business. I wasn't there for that long, just a couple of years, that ultimately I left the business because I wasn't comfortable doing this with my life. But I certainly will say that transactions that I was involved in, that my group at Morgan Stanley was involved in, weren't the kinds of things that you would be proud of looking back. Några år innan finanskrisen, innan allt kraschade, fick kommunstyrelsen i Narvik ett erbjudande som man inte kunde tacka nej till. Det handlade om att köpa amerikanska värdepapper som skulle rädda den fattiga kommunens ekonomi. Den blev lanserad av två mäglare som genom många år hade varit rådgivare för Narvik kommun när det gällt gälsro och rådgivning generellt. Så man hade stor tillit till de här två mäglarna. Det lät bra. Kommunen skulle få stora vinster bara man först skulle placera 250 miljoner kronor. Vi investerade cirka 250 miljoner. Vi blev, man forskuterade egendomsskatt från kraftverk. Så egentligen var det ju pengar man inte hade, men som man ville få. Det 
Da kom en journalist fra NRK Nordland, som er den nordnorske kringkastingen. Og lurte på om jeg sov dårlig på natta, fordi at her var noen produkter som de hadde fått melding om var særdeles risikofylt. Og det var helt nytt for meg da. Så jeg måtte få opp et notat fra økonomisjefen. Som i likhet med alle andre sa, sitt bare helt rolig i båten. Det her er sikre investeringer, det blir ingen problem. Så kom måndagen den 15. september 2008 och investeringsbanken Lehman Brothers kollapsade. De amerikanska värdepappren som Narvik hade placerat i förlorade sitt värde och Narvik gick miste om allt. Samtidigt insåg Narvikborna att de hade blivit lurade. Det som blev lagt fram för oss i bystyret då, det var ett, en översättning av ett prospekt. Och när man senare fick den amerikanska versionen så stod det ganska helt andra ting i den än i det oprinnliga prospektet. Jag vill gärna tro att det finns en genväg till rikedom. En riskfri placering. En gratis lunch. Det är bara mänskligt, men det gör oss sårbara. Så vi är på det hem av Bernard L. Madoff. Det är där han levde med sin fru Ruth. På 64th Street near Central Park i New York City. This is the home of the $65 billion Ponzi schemer. He's now in jail for 150 years. Two FBI agents came to his home here on the morning of December 12, 2008. They couldn't believe what they had heard. Uh, Madoff's two sons had turned him in to uh, regulators, and they came to his house in the morning. He answered in his bathrobe and his slippers. They asked him, is it true? that you have stolen all this money. And he said, yes, it is true. Bernie Madoffs företag byggde på ett så kallat Ponzi-bedrägeri, eller pyramidspel. Så länge alla bara satt in pengar i Madoffs företag kunde han fortsätta med bluffen. Men när hans kunder ville ta ut pengarna, då var spelet slut. Det fanns åtminstone en person som tyckte att det hela lät för bra för att vara sant. I wrote a story for Barron's magazine, which is a finance weekly here in the US. And I published the story in May of 2001. I raised questions about his returns, uh, about his fee structure, how he encouraged uh, a uh, fund of hedge funds to raise money for him and he paid them a 20% commission. So I raised all these red flags. The story came out and nothing happened. Nothing. About 7 years later, uh I was sitting on my couch in at home watching CNBC and the headline came over that Bernie Madoff had been arrested in this $65 billion Ponzi scheme. And I have to confess, I said, holy shit, they finally got him. <laughs> 